Hi, I'm Mark Gaylor. I'd like to walk you through my Lightroom Classic Workflows. Now, I'm a firm believer that photographs are made and not taken. It's not simply about the capture process, it's also about the post-processing of those images. And that's because cameras do not see what we see and cannot record what we feel. Cameras are merely mechanical devices without a soul. Cameras can collect information, sure, but their images do not communicate our memories and feelings without further development. The raw file is equivalent to the composer's score, while developing the image is the performance. Ansel Adams would often take the same negative into his darkroom, but each time he would come out with a different print, depending on what he wanted to express and what he wanted to communicate to his audience. Now, developing images in Lightrooms allows us to express our personal vision and tell our story. Some people will often tag an image when they're sharing it as straight out of camera, but for me that uh, means that they're just prepared not to make any personal response to what it was they were photographing. To give you an example of this, I was in Death Valley in the USA and my camera recorded this image straight out of camera. But this is actually what I wanted to express about this very dramatic place. Now, um, one of the reasons for the, um, the original image uh, looking the way it did was a combination of high levels of UV and at atmospheric dust, which sort of compressed the histogram, made it very low contrast, which sort of worked against the drama that I wanted to communicate. Our brains, and my brain in particular, didn't see the scene in this way because the brain makes the necessary adjustments. In the same way that uh, when we move from uh, tungsten lit interiors to daylight outside, our brain conducts an auto white balance for us. We don't have to adjust the white balance manually to our brain. In scenes with extreme subject contrast, the cameras are least likely to record the truth of what we see and feel about the scene. Lightroom, however, can restore the colour and tonality of what we remembered seeing. So is this image manipulation or is it merely just optimization? People often uh, uh, talk negatively about uh, people photoshopping their images as a way of lying or deceiving their audience. But in some ways it's more about telling the truth, is if what we're trying to do is trying to restore what we remembered seeing and more importantly what we felt about the scene. Sometimes the differences we make in post-processing don't have to be extreme. Sometimes they, become, they can be quite subtle in order to express what it was we were feeling and seeing at a particular location. For instance, in these sub-zero temperatures, I've already raised the exposure in post-processing by one stop, but I'm still not communicating what it was I was feeling at this location. So with a little bit more effort, and uh, moving a few more sliders, I can get to where I am uh, to a point where I am actually communicating uh, both what I saw and also what I felt when I was photographing at this location. I call this expressive editing a way of communicating what it is that we're seeing and feeling at a location. Now this image is straight out of camera at the top of some sand dunes in Western Australia. Now this is the truth as the camera saw it, but it's not what I remember seeing and certainly not what I felt about photographing at this particular location. So with a slightly different time of day and uh, certainly a little bit more effort by moving some sliders, I can communicate more honestly about what I saw and what I felt about the drama at this particular location. Now, for some other photographers, they may experience different things. So who is to say whether this is correct or whether this is correct? Something with a more uh, warmer a treatment uh, to represent the warm late afternoon sun that was falling at this location. Or maybe uh, somebody else might uh, feel uh, the tranquility of this environment and, and use some more pastel shades when editing this image. Uh, somebody else might see the drama of the light and shade and want to express this uh, by converting the image to black and white. So there are multiple truths uh, to this same or singular location when editing. Some people also don't intend to say the truth at all. They simply want to create a signature style in post-processing to basically put their mark on an image to say this is how I like to communicate um, my photographs to other people.
So before we go into some of the editing inside of Lightroom, I want to talk about color accuracy because as we are moving color, I think it's very important to make sure that we have color in control using the devices at hand. Now, one of the first things I would uh, encourage you to do is invest in a good quality monitor. Now, most monitors are reasonable quality. There are some shockers out there. However, I've been at workshops where some of the uh, screens on, on a laptop are really quite blue and there's no way uh, the, uh, the photographer can edit color in any degree of control because already the colors they're seeing have been skewed uh, quite cool. Now I'm using this 27-inch uh, 4K monitor with a broad color gamut. I can see much richer um, range of colors with full detail inside of those saturated colors. And so this is what I choose to use uh, to edit my images. I will edit on location on the laptop screen as well, but I will, uh, when always choosing a laptop, make sure those laptop monitor sc um, screens are of a reasonable quality. One of the other steps that I, I do take is I go the extra mile by also creating a profile for that monitor, which makes sure that the colors I'm seeing are faithful and accurate. Now, one of the things that uh, we can complete that um, color management workflow with is also to create a custom profile for your camera. I use this uh, color checker passport in order to do that. Some photographers uh, will start comparing color rendition from maybe Can Canon, Nikon or Sony, but you can actually remove that argument um, by make making your cam camera capture color colors faithfully. And then if you're working with a profile filed monitor, those same colors that are being captured faithfully will also be shown faithfully on that monitor screen. And if you're going to that uh, next step where you're actually printing your images, you should also get that extra mile as well and create a custom color profile for your paper ink combination. And then really, if you've been photographing a, a blue cyan of a particular uh, maybe bird or flower, when you print that out, that color will be faithful to your original subject. Uh, once you've set a color managed workflow up, it stays set up. So uh, you will have a faithful color managed workflow after you've uh, read and implemented the information. Okay, let's um, get to grips with uh, Lightroom Classic and we'll first uh, take a look at the subject of white balance. Now some photographers will start with white balance because it's at the top of the basic panel and some people, uh, so-called experts, will actually say that's the way you're supposed to edit in Lightroom, a uh, top-down approach. Uh, but I've been a beta tester for many decades now and the software engineers of Lightroom certainly don't intend for you to um, edit in a linear way because this is a non-linear, non-destructive editing package. Uh, so it doesn't really matter where you start editing and where you finish editing. Um, so what I would uh, encourage you to do is perhaps um, start editing with what annoys you the most about your image. What do you feel the camera has let you down most? Maybe it's exposure, maybe it is white balance, but start with editing that and then uh, finish off with editing the little things or the little annoyances, the ones that um, um, uh, you've noticed only at the end of the workflow. So in these uh, images, uh, even though I'm talking about white balance first, I've already had some edits. And, and sometimes I can't actually see to edit the white balance until I've corrected some of the tonality. Now, these images that it will follow are using auto white balance. This is the default for most uh, cameras that are sold now. Uh, we don't actually go in and create a custom white balancing camera unless we specifically want to. So most photographers just leave it auto white balance and then make a correction in post processing. Now, one of the problems with um, doing a white balance is when we first look at an image, unless it's a way off, uh, we often see that that is appropriate. And it's not until we move the white balance a little or a lot do we see that there is something better to be had. So I'm going to make some adjustments here, some befores and afters, so you can see uh, why I've chosen to move the white balance, not just for accuracy, but also um, for creating complementary colors in my workflow. For instance, in this one, I've moved the, um, the white balance a little bit cooler. And now 
we're getting some uh, cooler tones um, in the background uh, behind this soldier wearing these uh, warm toned clothing. Now this creates the complementary colors, colors that are on the opposite side of the color wheel and this creates a, a visually pleasing result for many people. It's also uh, allowed me to create the fact that um, actually the blue tones in the background actually communicate the fact that this was a wet and cool morning and so uh, I'm doing this for expressive purposes as well as for perhaps accuracy and the need to create complementary colors. To give you another example again auto white balance the sun has just set now so we're just using the the, the twilight glow it is a uh, quite warm lighting from the sky but uh, if I just um, lower the color balance a little bit further the skin tones carry on appearing warm but lowering it by 700 degrees Kelvin on that uh, that top slider in the white balance control that uh, temperature slider we're actually creating those complementary colors again. We're actually allowing that uh, sky to go bluer and create that complementary um, color to the warm skin. To give you another example, this is actually a little bit closer to what was I was actually photographing. But if I then um, move the tint slider, the one below the temperature slider, uh, to plus 16, I'm actually, um, uh, well, I moved it to minus 5 actually, but it's 16 points uh, difference between how the auto white balance saw it and uh, what I'm choosing to communicate. And what I'm doing now is I'm creating these uh, blue purple tones, which are the complementary color to those uh, yellow orange tones inside of this image. So again, I feel this is a better way to. Uh, uh, to showcase the drama in this particular scene. Another example again with the auto white balance again it's uh, sunset so they are warm colors but again just lowering that temperature slider this time by over two and a half thousand degrees Kelvin I'm great getting that nice mix between the the cool light of the shadows and also the warm light of the, both the sunset and also the tungsten artificial lights that are coming on in the buildings in this Melbourne uh, uh, skyline scene here. Okay so just moving the the, uh, the tint or white temperature slider can create dramatic differences um, and so you should never just accept the auto white balancing camera got it correct you should always explore uh, moving those uh, sliders just in case there is something that you would prefer this one um, for instance uh, the, the tones are actually quite neutral and the camera has recorded them a little bit cold in comparison to what the uh, what I was seeing. I've gone a little bit uh, over the top here in order to cre create this, uh, this sort of fiery scene with these uh, warmer colors to showcase the drama of the incoming uh, storm. And we also have the sun in view as well uh, behind these clouds so I also wanted to express the warmth of that sun cutting through these storm clouds. Uh, giving that sense of energy to this scene. So again we're using uh, color for to create complementary colors uh, maybe for accuracy but also for communicating feeling or emotion into a scene. Um, I was with a photographer at the sand dunes uh, just recently and uh, he started post-processing his sand dune images. Very, very cool. Now, one of the reasons that uh, somebody might want to do this is um, uh, blue is uh, talks about uh, maybe the, uh, it's the color of the sky, it's the color of the open sea, it's a, it's a sense of broad open space, maybe tranquility. And so if we take a look at these sand dunes and we're reminded of big waves in the sea and we're also trying to communicate communicate uh, that through the color blue then what's to say that um, lowering the uh, the temperature slider 2000 degrees degrees Kelvin is wrong because again it's just a way of communicating um, uh, a mood into a scene. Now if you've been watching Hollywood movies, I'm sure you have, you'll probably notice that um, they're not trying to create accurate colors in most of the movies you're watching. They're using color as a way of communicating mood into the scenes. So um, by all means play with those uh, white balance uh, not just for accuracy but also for expressing mood. Let's move on to the subject of exposure. Now one of the important things before we start playing with exposure in post-processing is to make sure that we don't lose any detail 
by inappropriate exposures in camera. One of the ways you can lose some of the detail in highlights is when a scene has dominant dark tones. The camera uh, thinks that these unlit areas need to be brightened up when in fact they are just very dark tones. And if uh, the dominant uh, tones uh, are extensive across the viewfinder, you'll find the automatic exposure will start raising the exposure and may push some of the highlights over the edge, uh, i.e. they will start to become overexposed and start losing information in those highlights. Now if you're a mirrorless user or using live view on your DSLR, you can actually get a histogram up and start viewing um, how that exposure is working using what's called a histogram. Now we'll talk a little bit more about histograms and how you can use them uh, to control exposure both in camera and also post-processing. But one of the things I will do in camera is if I notice this happening is I will simply uh, lower the exposure by maybe one EV, one stop using the shutter speed, um, the aperture or just using the exposure compensation dial which I'm highlighting here in this slide. And once you're pulling that information back into the histogram on that right side of the histogram then you know you're not losing detail anymore. Those live histograms will warn you if you've got um, data banked up on the right side of the histogram then it is a warning that you might be losing detail in those highlight tones. Now sometimes uh, we can recover a small amount of loss of tone in, in the highlights but in some cases we can't. If we push that exposure too bright we will end up with having uh, absolute um, uh, clean detail. There will be no detail to be pushed back into those tones in post-processing. If you're unsure you can always um, uh, review or chimp an image after you've captured it and try and find on your camera uh, where you can see the histogram. Um, sometimes uh, the cameras will often also have something called blinkies. They will uh, warn you of the over or under exposure by blinking those tones and so maybe you have the opportunity to take a second image with an adjusted exposure. So in this example here you can see those bright highlight tones are well inside of that right side of the histogram so I know I have an appropriate exposure in camera. Okay so the basic goal of um, that um, exposure and how we can work with that histogram is consider the histogram, the sides of the histogram as your goalposts and what we have to do when collecting um, the information, the tonality, um, we're trying to get all of that detail of the darkest shadow tones and the brightest highlight tones in between the goalposts. It doesn't really matter about the shape of the histogram uh, in the middle, it's more important that we get the information um, um, away from the extreme edges of that histogram. So the way you deal with this is um, occasionally you might be creating darker images than you would intend to um, uh, finally produce. But uh, so long as we're, we're recording the um, detail in those brightest highlights, which I've drawn an arrow to here, we can always open up the shadows in post-processing uh, such as this. So basically we're exposing for the highlights and processing for the shadows. And I'll give you um, several examples as we move through these slides. There is an, an exception to the rule. The only time we don't actually want detail in the brightest highlights is when those um, highlights are actually the light source themselves or a reflection of the light source off a shiny surface such as water or uh, metal. And uh, the reason that we don't want um, to see good detail in there is everything else would be way too dark. These um, highlight tones, the light source itself, is often referred to as specular highlights. And these we, are, we do allow to clip to overexposure. And in um, a Lightroom we can click on that triangle above the top right hand side of the histogram to get a clipping warning. And if it's just the light source that is clipping, we're okay. We haven't overexposed those particular tones. And the opposite is true in the shadows, is if we have the absence of a surface, maybe it's um, a cave entrance, or in this sense an open doorway, so we're not looking at an actual surface where light is falling on, we're looking at the absence of a surface, what I've called here is a void. Now in tonal terms, it is most photographers agree 
Ansel Adams set up something called the zone system, uh, sort of the rules of tonality, if you like. Now, rules are meant to be broken, but these are generally the rules that most photographers tend to adhere to. And most photographers would tend to clip these um, these. Um, tones that are not the surface but the absence of a surface, the absence of, of light at all. When we're setting uh, a white and a black point inside of Lightroom, we can do various auto ways. We can click on the auto button. We can hold down the shift key and click on the word whites or the words blacks. And we can set the, the white point and uh, black point automatically. It'll ge generally move the brightest tone to the right side and the darkest tone to the left side of the histogram. Uh, for many photographers who are shooting JPEG in camera, this is what generally happens with the processing inside of the camera. But for RAW shooters, we have to do this in post-processing. Now, most of the time, um, a Lightroom makes a good decision when um, setting those um, auto, white and black points. But in many instances, it doesn't. In this particular image, we don't have any bright tones outside of the character and um, as you're probably well aware Caucasian skin uh, the brightest tone of Caucasian skin isn't absolute white it's um, a couple of tones down the uh, the zone system in tonality there and so if we set that too high um, the sky the skin sorry the skin will appear to be too bright and so we have to sort of override uh, maybe any auto adjustment and just pull that white slider now it's the white slider that controls the extreme right side of the histogram so we not, may, may need to just pull that a little bit further to the left so we get good detail uh, so if I do that we're going to get more natural tone in the skin so this is one of the rare instances we, we don't use an auto adjustment to set those whites inside of this image another alternative to that processing maybe is just to pull the highlights further down uh, the highlights are the tones just below uh, the whites and uh, that's typically where the skin or Caucasian skin is sitting so we can pull that down just so we get rich detail in those brightest skin tones so sometimes it's a balance between highlights and white slider another important feature in post-processing and that is the ability to crop we've already framed the image in camera but we are going we have a second opportunity to perfect that framing Okay, so one of the things that I do, and because I'm using prime lenses a lot, I don't have the ability to zoom in or zoom out to get the perfect crop. Um, I, I will often just fine tune that crop in post processing. And one of the things that I'm often cropping for is to remove visual distractions at the edges of the frame. For instance, uh, this um, uh, image of this uh, ladder with beautiful shadow, I've got some sky on the right side which doesn't help the communication whatsoever so I'm simply going to crop it out in post-processing so the cropped image um, is less confusing the eye of the viewer isn't going to be pulled over to the right side of the image for seemingly no purpose at all it doesn't add to the communication so we just focus now just on the ladder and just on the shadow in this image Here's another example. Uh, I took this image very, very quickly. I just swung around as I sm saw some smoke happening out the periphery of my vision, uh, and I took one shot. And, uh, and we have some distractions at the top of the image, which doesn't help the communication in the lower part of the image. You can also see I'm using what's called a crop overlay you can cycle through your crop overlays by pressing the o key repeatedly inside of the crop overlay function or feature inside of lightroom this allows me to have the what's called the rule of thirds um, it's a compositional technique uh, which avoids a centering um, uh, information and the rule uh, basically states that we uh, we can try and put important elements on the important intersections and also on the lines and you can see I've sort of lined up um, the two characters on the rule of thirds and also where the pavement um, hits the wall um, we've also got the rule of thirds working quite well there now it isn't something that you always have to do it's just something that you might want to play with with some of your compositions and here is the final cropped image 
because we can't see that visual clutter at the top of the image uh, the eye of the viewer is held uh, with the two characters and the smoke and uh, the steps creating those diagonals and uh, one of the diagonals or in fact both the diagonals act as what's called leading lines taking the eye towards the two characters inside of the image this was um, uh, partly luck on my part uh, with um, uh, composing landscapes we have a little bit more time and a little bit more control to organize but in this case well, I was slightly lucky that some of these elements just lined up with the rule of thirds Here's another example. This was captured with a long telephoto lens um, from a boat and we have the water at the bottom of the scene. But uh, it's not really a communication about um, the water. It's simply a communication about um, this impenetrable sort of um, uh, bush or uh, forested area and it, using a long telephoto lens has really compressed the perspective and um, just altering the tonality slightly so I can get the uh, the bright white branches of those dead trees showcasing uh, gives, um, gives me the drama that I actually uh, wanted to communicate in this particular scene now uh, both um, the camera and also my human side probably wouldn't have seen the drama at the distance because of the amount of ultraviolet light softening the contrast in the situation so we're basically restoring that to the scene in uh, by uh, a lot of these um, uh, sliders that we've moved you'll see a negative blacks adjustment and a positive whites adjustment you'll also uh, see uh, added contrast on the contrast slider which is basically restoring the uh, the, the drama and contrast to this scene that was sort of eaten away a little bit by the extreme focal length of this lens. Okay so let's uh, take a look at one more example. Again we've got a little bit of water at the, uh, the bottom of the image which in this instance I've decided again doesn't help the communication so again I choose to crop out. For many photographers you um, they will choose to frame slightly wide and then crop a little bit tighter in post. Gives you a little bit more freedom when designing so we don't have to create the perfect crop in camera each time. And there is the final result in this instance, uh, which is exactly what I want. I just want to two elements here, uh, the forest and the rock. I don't need a third element, the water at the bottom of the screen. I don't want the viewer's um, uh, eye wandering to the edge of the frame. Here's another reason we may want to crop. I may have gone as close as I can go to the minimum focusing distance of the lens, but I want to go even closer. And so in this instance, I've just simply cropped. Most of us are using megapixel rich cameras, uh, and we can crop quite aggressively and still have enough pixels for a double page spread in a magazine, a very large print, or enough to fill our high, ultra high definition uh, TVs or 4K TVs. So in this sense, I've just cropped closer. Another reason we may want to just stand back a little bit is because of depth of field. The closer you move to your subject, the shallower the depth of field. So just by moving back and then cropping in post, we'll just extend the depth of field a little bit more. We're going to start using these crop overlays now. So rule of thirds is perhaps the, uh, the most famous uh, crop um, a rule that most people know and here it is exercised uh, or applied uh, uh, overlaid over this um, this cowboy in uh, Texas and um, you can see down the center of his face I put those intersections as this is the most important part of the composition and you can see um, his body his waistline also um, lines up with the lower horizontal line on that rule of thirds and also his the edge of his shoes line up with the the vertical line on the le on the left so again I did a little bit of that work in camera but I've just fine-tuned that in post-processing if we press the O key a number of times we'll come to um, something that looks on the surface to be the rule of thirds but actually the line the vertical lines and the horizontal lines are just a little bit closer towards the center and this is called the golden ratio and this actually predates the rule of thirds which is sort of a simplified golden ratio and for many landscape photographers and me included I actually prefer um, most of the time to put a horizon line um, on the lower uh, um, horizontal line of the golden ratio rather than the rule of thirds which I think is a little bit of extreme for many compositional uh, compositions that I'm creating.
Okay, so here's the golden ratio um, uh, in use with the vertical portrait. So we've got um, the eyes perfectly lined up with the intersecting points of the verticals and the top horizontal line. And so basically I've just um, uh, slightly rotated the image because uh, the guy was leaning back in a chair just to make that perfectly vertical and then just align that just by expanding and contracting um, the aspect ratio and just moving that until I get the perfect composition uh, that I wanted. Now we don't always have to create off-center uh, just because somebody said that um, rule of thirds or the golden ratio were the best um, uh, designs. We can also approach uh, a subject with the view to creating a symmetrical image and in this particular instance I wanted absolute symmetry. The vanishing point, the point where all of those converging lines um, converge right in the center of the image is, uh, um, is exactly what I wanted and so I'm not going to use the rule of rule of thirds or golden ratio in this instance because I want everything to uh, work around um, the middle point of both the vertical and horizontal in the frame. Another reason to crop is to change the shape of an image. Now we often using 3-2 or 4-3 sensors um, and uh, these don't tend to have any correlation with the majority of screens that we're using which tend to have a 16-9 or 16-10 aspect ratio. So we often have to, if we've been shooting in horizontal format, we often have to lose some of the top and the bottom or both in order to create that 16-9 aspect ratio. So in Lightroom we can actually pick up those aspect ratios on the right side of that crop overlay feature you'll have other options as well uh, that you can pick up. 16.9 is a common one because if we crop images to 16.9 and then view them on a large 30 inch or 27 inch um, monitor or a big Ultra HD um, uh, TV, um, that is absolutely going to fill that screen with no uh, what's called letterboxing top and bottom or on the uh, left and right side. And so as I go into full screen on this image, you'll see in the movie that you're watching, that will go full screen in the movie as well. So that's um, a great way of um, filling the, the viewer's attention so, uh, and using every pixel of the screen. Now one of the things that we, we can do when we're cropping is also have the information, just tap the I key a number of times and you can cycle through the information in Lightroom Classic. And uh, you'll also see in one of the information views, you'll see the pixel dimensions, not the pixel dimensions of the capture, but all, uh, the pixel dimensions of what you cropped down to. And so it's um, quite useful to know some of the pixel um, dimensions of some of the, um, the monitors that we're actually using. Now uh, 4K or Ultra HD as it's often referred to has a specific set of pixel dimensions and that is 3840 pixels wide and 2160 pixels high. Now this is exactly double the old HD format which often people referred to as 1080 HD. That was 1080 on the vertical dimension. Now the reason that these uh, pixel dimensions are useful is if um, if you are cropping and you don't want to over crop for the screen that you want to present on it's worth having this information highlighted so you know when if you crop any further you're going to be cropping um, down um, um, below the number of pixels that the screen uses. Now if the screen shows that image full screen generally it'll start um, softening the image it will start adding pixels to the equation but uh, something called interpolation but this is generally um, a bad idea if you're wanting absolute um, quality when um, showcasing your work on a 4k screen. Now it's also worth noting that um, a 4k image in um, megapixels is 8.3 megapixels so most people who are using say 24 megapixel sensors will quickly realize that we're actually we can crop and throw away two-thirds of the pixels and still have enough to fill a 4K screen. In this image you can see the crop overlay is quite extreme. We've got a lot of unused uh, pixels around that crop 
but we're still pulling a 3840 pixel width on this so it's still technically a 4k crop and the reason for this is it's coming from a 42.4 megapixel image and that does outline one of the advantages of using these ultra high resolution cameras is their croppability if that's a word um, and so and there we see if we go full screen that we're not going to lose any quality at all because we're not over cropping this particular image so that's another reason we may be cropping is we might be just getting rid of surplus uh, pixels because we didn't have um, a longer telephoto lens with us and so we're just cropping in post uh, we do have the option on many cameras to crop in camera as well word of warning for those people with 24 megapixel sensors when you crop to APS-C on a full frame camera you are coming down to 10 megapixels and when you crop cropping to the 16-9 aspect ratio, you've barely got enough pixels just to straighten a slightly crooked image before we hit that 4K mark. Now obviously we don't always have to uh, restrict ourselves to cropping to 4K and no more because some people will want to crop even further because their intended output is not a 4K screen. And to go, so to give you some of those pixel resolutions, just remember HD is um, half of the pixel dimensions of 4K. Uh, Facebook, the maximum um, uh, width or longest dimension, sorry, on a uh, an image going to Facebook is 2 048 pixels. If you upload anything with higher resolution, it will just be downsized to 2048. Um, and uh, Instagram is even less, it's um, uh, 1080 pixels wide. It's, um, it does highlight um, slightly why I'm a little bit confused about Instagram's popularity for showcasing photography when we have so few pixels on offer to showcase especially things like quality of camera, quality of lens, very hard to see when you're looking at perhaps just a, a one megapixel uh, from a, um, uh, a 42 megapixel camera. And so there is uh, the 4K crop again, just to highlight that we can uh, pull maximum um, detail, even though we've been cropping quite aggressively on some images. If you are exporting from Lightroom and you're exporting, say, a 4K image, uh, as you go to the export dialog, um, just take a look at these settings. We will be um, uh, using the JPEG file format because most people don't have um, a high uh, color gamut screens uh, like I have. Uh, it's typical to actually drop the color space to sRGB. It's very important to make sure um, the image being exported does have a color profile if you're not using sRGB. So just to play safe, sRGB. Quality, you can go up to 100, but to be honest, um, uh, as long as you don't re-edit um, uh, an exported JPEG, um, you're not going to see any difference between quality 90, but the image is going to upload um, a little bit faster because it's going to be significantly smaller, just a quality 90. Um, one of the things that I do do is um, resize to fit. And this is where you put in the long edge and then put in the pixel dimensions um, that you're looking for, 3840, as I said, for 4K. Um, there is a resolution screen next to this, but um, resolution um, in pixels per inch or pixels per centimeter is only ever used for printing when the image is going to paper. So it bears no, um, it doesn't matter at all what you put into that little dialog. It doesn't affect the export whatsoever. So you could put in one or 1000, doesn't change the size of the image being exported. Now you might want to check the little box above that resolution which says don't enlarge. If you have um, cropped uh, quite aggressively, you may choose not to uh, grow that image uh, through interpolation using Lightroom. So one of the other options there below that is output sharpening. Because we are downsizing quite a lot, especially for social media, um, you will get um, a sharper image um, by adding a little bit of sharpening in at the, uh, at the export um, level. And so I would check that sharpen for um, select screen or print um, important for screen especially and then just choose you can choose uh, standard as the as the average there I do have some uh, export presets that uh, are available uh, on my uh, website in the download section there if you're looking uh, to create some social media export presets there so you don't have to actually enter these in at all
So let's uh, go back to uh, Lightroom's um, editing tools and we'll look at one of the most important uh, pair of sliders that are available to us in the basic panel and that is shadows and highlights. Some photographers, old school photographers, will use some old school tools and these old school tools are curves. Now um, I used to teach how to get the best out of curves before we were editing with these raw editors such as Lightroom, Adobe Camera Raw, Capture One etc. And uh, this was the, the tool uh, that we were using. We used them in association with what's something called luminosity masks, which was a way of um, uh, uh, calming down the aggressive behavior of curves on some of the adjacent tones we were trying to push. Now, uh, it's important to note that we don't have the option for luminosity masks in Lightroom. And so there is a great danger that we can actually damage Im images quite easily by trying to adjust their tonality using curves inside of a program program site like Lightroom. And because these are old school tools, we actually have access to much better tools in the basic panel. And these are, of course, shadows and highlights. Now, one of the things that most people are aware of when they're pulling their image into a, a raw editor, um, uh, the, uh, the initial preview that you see just momentarily might disappear for something altogether darker. And that's because it's discarding the JPEG preview that the camera created and creating a new profile for the raw editor Lightroom. And uh, one of the things that will often change quite substantially is the shadows. Shadows are often made a lot brighter um, for JPEGs in camera using some of the features like dynamic range optimizer in the Sony camera and this is not applied to the raw file. So uh, we have to basically um, lighten up the shadows in post-processing using the shadow slider. So uh, a lot of people, when they look at an image like this, um, it's, it's absolutely nothing like what I remember seeing. And this is where, again, the cameras do struggle. Shooting into the light is one way to really make shadows dark. And uh, the sky also has none of the drama and color that I was witnessing there. So the, the camera has actually failed quite badly at recording anything approaching uh, what it was that I was actually seeing. And when a lot of people see an image like this, they're often confused about where they should start. And you certainly wouldn't start with white bands because we can't actually see any of the colors to adjust. So the sliders that are most obvious to adjust first are shadows and highlights. And so just by pushing this, and you'll notice that I'm not timid here. Uh, don't start nudging sliders by two and three increments. Um, it's basically would be like going to a golf course with only the putter. Uh, we really have to start off with, with a tool that can really drive the tonality in very large jumps. And so just be quite um, generous with your adjustments on those shadows and highlights adjustment. If you are trying to see what's inside of the deep um, shadows and also the brightest highlights, and only then can we really turn our attention to other tools such as contrast and white balance, blacks and whites, etc., to optimize this image. Now, uh, when people see uh, where the image started, and yes, this is the same image, but where when a lot of people see my finished image, um, they say, well, there must have been a lot of editing there. And so just to dispel the fact that we've made a huge difference in the image, but it actually doesn't take that long if you know the sliders to go to. And so what I've done is I've created a movie on my YouTube channel in the Lightroom section. And uh, I've got a, just a specific group of movies where I only spend one minute making an edit. And this is one of those movies. I go from the original raw state right through to the finished edit in a minute. And so you don't have to be worried that uh, some of these um, big changes do take a lot of time. So check that movie out. It's, uh, it's one of the uh, typical workflows that I do use on uh, dramatic uh, landscapes where I do have those very dark shadows that I'm trying to uh, check or put back into balance there. And the other thing, um, thing that I would advise is as you're reviewing images, don't just pass over images because they don't look good at first sight. 
Um, if you were quite excited when you were taking the image, for instance, it is worth spending just um, uh, 10 seconds or 20 seconds just exploring what it what it was that excited you to take that photograph in the first place. So this is the straight out of camera raw image, but if I just um, open up the shadows and bring down the highlights, and I've done a little bit of keystoning, which I'll talk to you about later because the tripod was on the ground and we had some converging verticals, we can see that we can uh, bring a lot of information and life and vitality. And this is what actually excited me to take this image. It's, um, I think it was, uh, yes, it's a five second exposure but the guy basically with his mobile phone wasn't moving. I've also added uh, or enhanced a little bit of the blue light coming from the mobile phone because this is the focal point of the image and I wanted that as a complementary color to the warm colors um, around the doorway where this guy is standing. But um, the most important um, adjustments here was just adding one stop in exposure and really ramping up the shadows and then bringing down the highlights again. Now, a lot of the images that I'm shooting in um, in difficult lighting situations, they don't really um, are faithful to what I was seeing. So a lot of them um, don't look that great when I first see the raw image. You'll also notice my very low vantage point for this image. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to crop and also open up those shadows. And you can see how much uh, this image moves with just those adjustments. And again, this is basically a one or two minute edit to get to where I'm going. And this is really what I'm looking for. And I'll just go through a bunch of these. This is exposing um, for the highlights. We've got some um, some very bright bokeh balls in the background using my 85 1.4. So I am pushing the um, the hero figure maybe a stop darker than I would have liked. But if I got the correct exposure for the figure, I'm going to push those highlights in the background over the top. And I do want to put some detail and color back into the into that bokeh there. So the post processing again brings that to life. So plus one on the exposure and um, plus 50 on the shadows, bringing that back to life. Um, also, um, uh, you know, you've got back, uh, backlit scenes such as with water or sky. You might want to open up the exposure so you get the perfect subject exposure. But uh, would you do that at the risk of the background? And in many instances, I will add some exposure to brighten up my subject, but not at the risk of losing the highlight in the background. And so again, post-processing um, to restore the tonality of my primary subject there. So again, you know, obviously I don't want to um, uh, get too much more exposure in camera because if I do, I'm going to push some of that white plumage over the top and then I'll lose the structure of that uh, the plumage, uh, which would be very sad in this instance because I pretty much nailed the focus of this um, this raptor in flight here. And uh, this is the hero now it is again just one stop um, extra in the in um, post processing and again plus 60 on the shadows quite generous, but restoring the beautiful tonality to this flying bird and again uh, now I could have opened up the exposure a little bit more in camera had it not been for that foreground we got some bright elements in the foreground and again if I'd have opened up one stop in in camera I may have lost that detail and so sometimes I'll also put in a little bit of a graduated filter over that uh, over an overly bright um, bottom or top to the image. And we're going to be looking at that uh, shortly, graduate, uh, graduated filters. Exposing for the highlights, um, if you have uh, watched my uh, preparing a camera for street photography in sunny weather, so I, ref I ref usually use something called the Sunny 16 rule. And this ensures the brightest highlights aren't overexposed. This can lead to some very dark shadows as we see in this image. Now we've got a little bit of information in those dark shadows. And uh, if you were following my uh, shadow uh, workflow for landscapes, you might want to open them up further so we can see the beautiful texture and detail. But actually, it's detail in this in instance that I don't want to see. So I'd actually do a negative shadows um, adjustment in this instance. I'd push them even darker so no one will be looking into those shadows. And this is the sort of drama that I wanted in this instance. 
Okay, and another example of, of moving shadows to the left rather than to the right. Uh, I could uh, bring up much more detail in the uh, rock faces behind this huge iceberg in Alaska. But in this instance, I just want you to concentrate on the drama of the iceberg itself, the small bird just off to the right of that iceberg and also uh, the boat, a very small boat compared to that large iceberg. And I don't want you looking at the shadows in the background. Again, it's a way of controlling the communication and, and telling the story that I want to tell in this image. Now, I, I have encouraged you to be bold with those sliders, but in some instances you can be too bold uh, with groups of sliders that together um, can create what's called artifacts, non-image data or shadows or highlights around objects that shouldn't really be visible. Um, in many instances you can be very generous and get away with it, but in some instances you can't. So I've highlighted an example where an extreme shadows and extreme highlights and uh, together with a lot of clarity will start throwing off halos around the edges of the darker shapes going into this very bright sky. Be aware of this because as soon as you start seeing this happen, you do need to back off on one of those sliders. In some instances, there's, a, there's another way of getting to where you want to go by using localized adjustment tools. But um, certainly uh, backing off on the clarity or backing off on the negative highlights uh, will restore um, or get rid of dark shadows or bright halos moving around subjects. So keep on the lookout for those. Another important panel is uh, the HSL, Hue, Saturation and Luminance panel. Now, sometimes uh, just a single color can be quite distracting. Uh, it, it sort of detracts from the main subject in many instances. In this particular portrait that I was shooting of Gilba Namala in the Northern Territories, um, the character is great and we've got a good uh, complementary color to go with the character behind. Um, nicely out of focus because I've moved Gilba maybe a meter away from that background and we're using shallow depth of field. But he's wearing sort of this um, uh, purple um, necklace and, the, and some blue purple tones on his shirt that I think detract. Now just changing the color of Gilba's shirt isn't going to remove Gilba's personality. Um, the likelihood that he owns this shirt now is probably remote and so I have no um, uh, no problem with simply changing the color or desaturating that color that, that is getting in the way of this communication. Now for somebody working for a newspaper, uh, a photojournalist who's creating a document or record, they often need to be accurate and faithful to the subject. So they don't have the luxury of being able to move color in this way. Uh, bizarrely or ironically they can change to black and white and get rid of all color but they can't modify a single or two or three colors uh, individually so it's just one of the rules and regulations that uh, photojournalists have to abide to uh, if they're not going to lose their job um, another example here is um, uh, looking at this uh, this animal here we have uh, um, quite a vivid green background which doesn't seem to suit the animal itself and one of the reasons this was captured at a zoo not out in the wilds of Africa. And so um, um, just um, desaturating that color and moving the color from green maybe to yellow, uh, we can get um, a background that doesn't fight or vie for attention with the primary subject. Remember we got hue, saturation and luminance there. So you can not only just pick one, say the green, and move it to yellow, but you can also then um, desaturate that color and you could also make that color darker to get the perfect background behind your primary subject. And these, um, this HSL will actually um, switch to a, a black and white panel because it is possible to uh, change the luminance of colors even when we've dropped to black and white. So yes, that um, sky is blue even though we can only see it as a tone of gray now. But if we grab that blue and cyan slider and move them to the left, we could basically pull that um, uh, blue sky right the way to black. I'm not sure that I would do that in every instance, but it just shows you the power of the HSL tools in that panel for targeting a specific color or colors and then moving them to where you want them to go.
Okay, in this example, uh, I've asked the question, who's looking at the gorilla or who's looking at the grass? That green is very vivid. And um, and if you just wanted to pull the, the, the viewer's attention just to the gorilla and get them to completely ignore that uh, green background, then we can again do that using the HSL panel. Another very powerful tool is vignettes. Now um, I've just created this outrageous claim here, and I've I've never <laughs> I've never um, checked to see how many photographers add vignettes and how often they do it. But I, it, the vignettes are very um, prevalent in post processing. I have to say that, and they predate uh, programs like Lightroom and Photoshop. We were, a lot of photographers have been adding vignettes for a very long time, and one of the reasons that photographers often like to do this is it it creates this tunneling effect. It draw it draws the view viewers attention away from the edges of the frame and draws them into the subject in the frame and um, it's a very powerful tool for controlling communication and so what I've said here is approximately 50% of all photographers vignette 50% of their images and if this was anyway indeed accurate we'd say that one in four images that we looked at ever would have a vignette applied and it is a powerful tool and sh something should be explored if you're not one of the 50% of those photographers that's okay but uh, I did want to highlight how often the vignettes are used in post-processing now I actually prefer the color priority um, version of the vignettes. There is a drop down menu with a couple of options there. The top two are the most common. Uh, the color priority isn't the default but I actually prefer this. I think there's a little bit more um, control. There's a little bit less damage to the dark tones in the corners and so I prefer to use color priority. So um, some people fall in love with vignettes so much that they start getting very aggressive with vignettes and what I would uh, encourage you perhaps not to do is get so aggressive that people are very aware of the vignettes as soon as they see the image. And one of the um, things that does tend to happen as the image gets smaller and smaller on screen the vignette tends to become more and more um, obvious and so uh, I would invite you to look at the grid view and if you can see the vignette in the grid view um, the thumbnail of your image then um, you may have overcooked that vignette so you might just want to back off a good vignette uh, should only really be noticeable uh, after you've switched it off and people go oh, the corners have got suddenly brighter I wasn't even aware that there was a vignette at play there so um, as you can see from the other two images in that um, uh, grid view um, you'll see that it's not obvious there's vignettes on those and indeed there almost certainly is vignettes on those other two images Let's take a look at the masking tools inside of Lightroom Classic. This will allow us to do a localized adjustments in our photos. Okay, let's take a look at this image. I've already edited the image to some extent, but I'm not happy with how bright that sky is. I think it's quite distracting to the building structure and the guy pushing the pram in the foreground. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on that masking icon below the histogram. I've added three linear gradients to this image to dark the immediate foreground leading up to those bollards. I put two um, linear gradients over the sky and what I'm trying to do here is to uh, express how dark and cloudy this uh, rainy day is in Melbourne. Okay so I think that has really now highlighted the bridge and drawn focus to the guy walking with that pram. As you can see in the pre-edit version, um, with those um, very bright highlights in the sky, even though it is a grey sky, are quite distracting. Okay, so let's take a look at another image where I've added a linear gradient to darken the blue sky to draw attention to that uh, impressive looking iceberg washed up on the beach in, the, in Alaska. So unfortunately what has happened, in order to darken the sky, I've also darkened the top of that iceberg. The technique I used to add this particular linear gradient was one, to click on that masking icon, two, to click on the linear gradient option. Alternatively, we could use the keyboard shortcut, um, which is the M key. 
three is to drag that uh, gradient um, from the top of the image down towards that horizon line. Now, the longer the gradient, the more uh, subtle that gradient will be. And four is then to lower the exposure. We're not restricted just to one adjustment slider. We can um, add in additional sliders. I've also added in um, a, mi a minus a highlights value and a positive shadows value to this particular um, a graduated filter or linear gradient as they're now known as. There is, a, however, a better alternative technique for protecting the tones of that iceberg. And that is um, one, to click on that masking icon again. This time, two is to select color range. I only want to darken the blues in this particular image. Three is to, with the eyedropper tool, select a range of colors. I'm not going to go too close down to the horizon line now. I don't want to pick up some of those white wispy clouds. So I'm staying uh, staying in the darker blue area of that sky and when I've made that um, I, or I've identified the color range I want to work with I then simply lower that exposure slider and this alternative workflow to the linear gradient has protected um, the ice at the top of that iceberg. Let's take a look at another use of a linear gradient now. Again, I've dragged that linear gradient with a minus one stop exposure down towards that horizon line. This time, um, that uh, negative exposure adjustment has darkened those white wispy clouds at the top of the image. So instead of selecting color range because we're working in black and white, I could select a luminant range or I can subtract uh, uh, a luminance range from this particular uh, linear gradient. So what I've done is uh, working with that existing um, uh, linear gradient, I've selected the subtract and then cho chosen the luminous range. Again, I need to go into the image with an eyedropper and select the tones that I want to subtract from that darkening linear gradient. And this has done a sterling job of um, rendering those white wispy clouds um, bright uh, white again. Let's take a look at another linear gradient now. Again, I've added the linear gradient to the top of the sky to darken the top. But uh, what I want to do is I want to reinstall or uh, return some of the transition from the orange sky to the blue sky that was much higher. Unfortunately, I've been working with a slightly longer focal length lens. So the blue that I remember seeing is actually out of the top of the frame. So I want to bring it back into the framing that I currently have here. So as well as lowering the exposure, I'm now going to um, lower the temperature slider to render um, that a little bit more blue. It's sort of a little bit cheating, but I did experience that transition from orange to blue, just not inside of this uh, angle of view of this particular lens. It's also um, enhanced that uh, complementary colors of the blue and the orange. And so I think this is a much more successful image that I've created here. Now I'm a fan of this technique, so what I've done here is I've done the same thing. I've lowered the exposure this time by one and a half stops. And again, I've been lowering the temperature slider. This time I'm working with a much longer focal length, so the blue is well out of frame. So it's been less quick to respond to the blue. So I've had to drag that temperature slider all of the way down to minus 100. I think it's important not to edit by numbers, but edit by feel. If you need to push that slider further to get the outcome that you want, then that is the way you should follow. If that's still not blue enough, I could uh, push in a little bit of extra saturation on that saturation slider as well. But I'm happy with the, uh, the more subtle blue at the top of this image in this particular instance. Another example of using these uh, linear gradients, which I'm a big fan of, is um, again to um, draw attention to the focal point of this image, this family of monkeys, which I think is one of my favorite wildlife shots here, uh, all lined up on this fence in uh, Bali, just outside the monkey forest. But I do find that towards the center of the image, just below the monkeys, the highlights in those sunlit trees are just a little bit distracting. So what I want to do 
is again I want to come in with a linear gradient here, uh, darken that down, this time just by two thirds of a stop, but I've also added a minus highlights value as well. And so the final outcome now is well, the eyes is drawn less away from the monkeys, so that background becomes less distracting. So I've used uh, two techniques here, basically um, to defocus the background, but also to darken the bright highlights so they're not too distracting. One of my other favorite uh, tools uh, for these masking features is the radial gradients. This is where we can shine a light on the hero part of the subject. It's a bit like using fill flash except in post-production. So the workflow again is one click on the, um, the masking icon. You could uh, alternatively uh, to come straight to the radial gradient just uh, hold down the shift key as you press the M key. But in this instance I'm just uh, selecting radial gradient from the options. Three is to drag that radial gradient. If you come outside of that radial gradient you can twist that radial gradient so it's at an angle. So this is not um, uh, um, it's slightly uh, at, a, um, at an angle to the one that I originally drew out. And four, just coming again into that exposure slider, and this time adding a positive exposure adjustment uh, to lighten the face of this young woman taking the photographs. Now what will happen, uh, unlike fill flash, which wouldn't travel into the background, um, you might detect a, a slight halo of light coming off um, the, uh, the principal part of the adjustment. So we can um, go back into that uh, radial gradient and select subtract as one of the options. I'm coming in as number two to select the brush tool. And then uh, I'm going to select auto mask. We've got a nice clearly defined edge along uh, the front of this woman's face. And so the auto mask will let us stay behind the edge of the face without having to paint too carefully with this brush. And the fourth operation is simply to go in and remove any light that is uh, falling outside of the face and onto the background. So we're less likely to experience a halo uh, when we're adding light to the principal subject. Okay, let's uh, look at um, lens corrections now. Okay, we've done a lot of the heavy lifting with sort of the uh, color and tonality now but there are some things that I also like to pay attention to. Now um, in this um, uh, um, particular image we're using um, quite a cheap kit lens on an A6000 I think it was or an NEX6 which even predates the 6000 and you can see we've got um, quite a lot of barrel distortion. You can see those verticals on the right side here um, they're bowing unnaturally. They're not bowing in real life. That is a distortion uh, from the lens itself. Now we can actually remove those distortions because um, Lightroom can build up um, the nature or characteristics of individual lenses when used on a specific camera. And so by coming to the Lens Corrections panel, and then uh, choosing Enable Profile Corrections, we can get um, Lightroom to correct those distortions. Now, if you're using a very old version of Lightroom that predates the lens, don't expect this to happen, okay? Because um, you have to update um, uh, Lightroom periodically, so it adds new camera profiles and also new lens profiles, so it can make these sorts of corrections. For some cameras, they can actually make these corrections in camera as well, and sometimes they can't. So we do want to um, uh, check uh, whether that's possible or not. There is a, a, a lens correction that um, Lightroom can't fix, and often the cameras can't fix it either. And this is something called color fringing. It's slightly different from um, chromatic aberration, which is a misalignment of the red, green, and blue wavelengths on high contrast lines. You might see that by zooming into the corners. Now, as soon as chromatic aberration is fixed, we'll, we can get rid of those color, very small, thin color halos coming off uh, harsh edges. But one of the colors that uh, isn't um, um, removed from that uh, tends to happen, and it's not um, always at the edges. It's where you've got uh, darker tones uh, with very bright tones behind them uh, or abutting those dark tones and this is often referred to as color fringing and they're, they're often apparent when we're using very wide aperture lenses. 
So if you're using an f1.8 or 1.4 lens, wide open, with a very bright tone behind your subject, you'll often see this color fringing. Now we can actually um, um, go some way to removing this partially or fully inside of Lightroom. We need to go over to the manual um, panel. So I'll come away from profile, uh, click on the manual tab there. Once we're in the manual, and we're in the manual now, uh, pick up the eyedropper, which you can see docked here. Okay, we then take that into the image and we, we actually see um, a, a magnified view of pixels. That grid that you can see here now in the center are magnified pixels. Now there are no purple pixels on this guy's hand. That is the color fringing. And so if we if we target one of those purple pixels and that uh, a magnified view helps us target just the one we want, click on it and then those that color fringing can disappear. Okay, so uh, in this instance it's disappeared. Sometimes it can be a little bit aggressive and desaturate too much and so you may want to back that off on the amount slider there. One of the things I do with um, Lightroom is I don't start off with the Adobe defaults. That's where we have all of the sliders zeroed out in that basic panel. I do like to make some adjustments so that they're applied to all of the images coming in from a particular camera without me then having to uh, make those adjustments one image at a time. So raw files are partially cooked. We never truly see a raw file in its completely raw state. Even Adobe and Capture One, they do apply apply some settings or adjustments to the image like we might get a default amount of sharpening on top we don't start out with completely zero so we can keep carry on modifying um, those default settings so they're more in line with how we prefer to edit most of our images so the way we're going to tackle this first is let's take a look at um, Adobe Color, which is often the default uh, profile that we start images. We can, however, go into the profile browser. Those, those four little uh, oblongs, um, you know, that's the icon called profile browser. If we go in there, we can select an alternative starting point to edit our images. So before we go any further, perhaps we should uh, note that we can choose alternative starting points without moving a single slider. So if we come into the profiles, for instance, we can uh, come in to the camera matching profiles. We might see um, some of the um, profiles that we could have applied perhaps in our camera. So here we have some options for this particular camera, which I believe is an Alpha 9 camera. And we can select any one of these as an alternative starting point. And you can see that we get um, large thumbnails, so we can see a preview before actually selecting that alternative starting profile. One of the things that I like to do, however, is make my own custom profile. Now, what I use for this process is an X-Rite Color Passport. This ensures absolute color accuracy um, for the sensor in my camera. It's not a one profile fits all cameras. So if there's any deviation in uh, manufacturing, uh, the profile I create will be ideally suited for my uh, camera and my sensor in my camera. One of the things I should point out about the X-Rite Color Passport, it tends to nail the hues, but the saturation does tend to be a little bit high. So if you notice that uh, even though the colors are accurate, you find the saturation values are a little bit high, you would go into the HSL panel and lower the saturation of some of the colors that you might find a little bit saturated. I think X-Rite has gone for more pleasing color saturation values rather than accurate color saturation values. Okay, so if, you've, um, if you want to add this as a favorite, so you don't have to click on the profile browser icon, you can now access your favorite profile from the drop down menu. So there it is. If I just uh, click on the profile, I should be able to cycle down now to my favorite profile that I've created and added as a favorite. Now, one of the other things that I would like to add to the default, my custom default, is not only um, the alternative profile, but also to enable profile corrections. We can do profile corrections in the camera for JPEGs and movies, but 
raw files don't tend to have the in-camera corrections applied with perhaps one exception and if we click on that little information built-in lens profile applied we do find that it's had the chromatic aberration applied in camera but not the lens shading um, um, so we we can get more lens corrections by going to the enable profile corrections and perhaps one of the most important uh, lens corrections is distortion if you're working with a very wide angle lens you can remove barrel distortion now by enabling those profile corrections so what I would do is the next step I would do is enable profile corrections when I'm setting up uh, my own custom default I don't move any sliders uh, at all I, I hit the reset button uh, before choosing an alternative profile then number two coming into the lens corrections it's important that when we create a, a new default we don't have any unusual settings already applied to the camera otherwise they will get applied to each and every image if that becomes the new default next thing I'm, I'm doing is I'm going into the detail panel and I'm uh, um, applying my preferred levels of sharpening the default sharpening um, is now 40 for Lightroom but I've raised that to 70 and I'm also masking where that sharpening takes place I don't want to sharpen any noise in the um, outer focus areas such as the bokeh I don't want to sharpen too much skin detail so I'm raising that masking slider so which restricts the sharpening to some of the more high contrast edges the other thing I might add into this uh, profile I do actually like um, a little bit of subtle post crop vignetting so I've gone into the effects panel and I've chosen color priority as my vignette of choice and just um, lowered that to minus 15 this will also become part of the new default we then go over to the presets panel and we choose create preset now it's very important that we start by um, choosing check none and then only selecting um, those things that we want to be part of the new default for instance treatment and profile that means color and uh, my custom profile that I created I might have added some contrast highlights and shadow values that uh, I want to become part of the new default but I'm being selective here now I'm not uh, adding exposure white clipping or black clipping I'm adding my sharpening I might have added a little bit extra vibrance um, another 10 or 20 vibrance because I do like my images to be colorful I've added the lens corrections that's the lens profile corrections and uh, I'm also adding effects post crop vignetting and also the process version which is the Lightroom process version and then I'll hit uh, create you can uh, um, have this going to the user defaults or you can set up a new default if you're creating a new camera default for different cameras that you might own we then need to go to Lightroom's preferences we need to check that um, well first we come over to the presets uh, tab that's the second uh, tab along we check the uh, use default specific to camera model checkbox um, from the camera uh, drop down menu we choose the camera we're creating the, uh, this new default for and uh, what we will then uh, do is um, come over and choose instead of the Adobe default we'll choose preset and then we'll come to the preset that we just created in the previous set and I called my new preset Sony A9 and I'll select that one and then I'll hit the create default button and that will add um, a new default just for this specific camera it will only be the new default for images coming or it being imported from this specific camera so you can create different um, defaults for different cameras and now when you're in the um, um, uh, the develop module and you hit reset you'll notice all of the sliders don't zero back to zero they zero back to your new default so there we've got um, highlights I've I typically start with minus 60 on the highlights plus 60 on the shadows uh, and uh, plus 20 on the contrast and so when I hit the reset it, they won't go back to zero they'll simply go back um, to my default that I had or loaded in that preset and then made that uh, the new default in the preferences.
What I want to do now is I want to spend some time looking at um, black and white conversions. Sometimes I see on the forums is uh, some uh, people will put a color image uh, beside a, a black and white image and say which one do you prefer. Now generally I, I'm not going on it image by image. I'm, I've got a specific thing I want to communicate and sometimes black and white suits what it is that I'm trying to say. I'm not often or always just choosing the one that looks prettiest and uh, often when you put a color image right next to a black and white image it's very difficult working out which one looks better. Okay, so usually you should look at them um, separately, not side by side. And I've got one example uh, later. Okay, so why choose to convert to black and white at all? And one of the um, main reasons that I will choose is drama. If I am um, a, a big scene that has uh, that I was bowled over when I first saw it. I want to really put on a lot of drama and actually the color isn't actually contributing to that drama then I may consider um, changing a whole series of images to black and white in this instance. Uh, so if color is a distraction to what it is you're trying to say then do certainly consider black and white especially if it's more about tone or light and shade than it is about color now the image uh, this image was actually captured not at the uh, the early morning or the uh, the late evening when the colors can be rich and we can get a lot of drama and color it was actually captured in the middle of the day so the color really was quite insipid and flat and so i didn't feel that it uh, was helping uh, the drama of the situation at all so I was quite happy to um, convert this one into black and white. Another example is sometimes again the colors not contributing and it's definitely in this in instance the, the light and shade or the shadows uh, that is uh, extending into this image. Um, and this The shadow of the tree really needs to be highlighted for me in this image because this is what I noticed in this scene and certainly by dropping the image into black and white and darkening off that blue sky I can really make the, that, um, the shadow coming off this tree very dramatic indeed. Uh, I recently was in Japan photographing at a sumo stable, um, a sumo wrestlers in training and um, we had some uh, fluorescent lights and also some daylight coming in from some high windows top right of this image that you're looking at and again the, uh, the mismatch of color light sources was not helpful and um, but what I did like was the back lit illumination uh, hitting the uh, the edges of the bodies and I really wanted to highlight this in the post processing so I decided to um, uh, post press the whole series in black and white and now sort of the uh, the sweat on the bodies and the shape of the bodies are really enhanced by converting these images to black and white. I'm predominantly a color photographer but certainly uh, when when I, I do know the power of black and white in some instances sometimes it might just be the client wants to have a preference uh, and that might dictate the way you light something but uh, certainly some in some situations um, black and white carries a certainly a different style of story and communication and I think there's nothing better to highlight the the way that um, uh, black and white can be dramatic and carry more weight um, especially uh, drama in a scene is with this uh, image that I captured of the A-bomb dome in Hiroshima in Japan. Um, this was directly below the um, the, ep the hypercenter of the blast and uh, stands as a monument now to peace. Um, now uh, when I'm looking at this image uh, it's um, I think the color of the image, the color again is getting in the way um, as, a, as, a, as a historical period piece with drama and uh, weight of communication I really was quite keen now to drop a whole series of images that I captured in Hiroshima into a black and white and use black and white as the narrative. It also gave that historical feel to what it is that I'm photographing and uh, certainly in a, say another example this was actually the, the actual hypercenter the A-bomb dome was a, a block or two away from the hypercenter we got this guy in what appears to be a medical coat coming a pass um, this hypercenter monument actually is next to a, a medical clinic and so I really wanted to tie these two elements together and also use the light and shade now uh, by I could see the shadow and I was actually waiting for that shadow I was aware of the light that was happening at this time and it's very close to 8.15 which is when the bomb 
detonated um, um, all of those years ago. So um, again, I'm trying to match as much of the communication as I can leverage and black and white is one of those components that I'm using to tell the story. When I was uh, in the sand dunes and I showed you the um, the what if scenario early in the presentation about uh, would we go in color, should we warm the colors up, should we use pastel colors, and for me when I created these series of images, I was thinking of the drama of um, uh, an Ansel Adams shot, which I started this cat this black and white category with, and that is using um, um, not thinking about the color at all, but just using the shape and the way the light interacts with the shape of the sand dune. So this is really just a story about light and shade. Now one of the things that we can pick up at the right at the top of the basic panel uh, when we're looking at profile and typically it'll be set to Adobe Color or Adobe Standard using older versions of Lightroom. We've got those four little white squares that you can see there and if we click on them it opens up the profile browser and if you go to the black and white section of the profile browser you can roll your mouse over and look at variations flavors of black and white and if we go right to the bottom of um, those options there I think there's about 17 black and white options we'll see the options that we used to use uh, when using analog black and white film by pulling colored filters colored filters would darken their complementary color so an orange filter would darken a blue sky and uh, we could certainly create um, different uh, renditions by darking and, uh, certain colors and lightening others and so this is a way of before we even move any sliders is getting a look at how we would prefer to use as a starting point before we start adding graduated filters vignettes doing some maybe localized adjustments and global adjustments now what I've got here is is a tutorial that I've often used at workshops to highlight how powerful black and white processing is when we when we're in control. Now I, I don't always think that the best way to convert black and white is with a single click or a preset that you may have downloaded because you are telling a story and and where you choose to darken the image and where you choose to lighten the image is a very important part and um, uh, Lightroom will never know what it is that's important in the image so you have to go in and manually select areas and choose what to darken and what to lighten. Now we can certainly start off with a preset. So this is the finished version so I just wanted to show you how different um, a color unedited version is from the black and white edited version. You would, you, you would, I would hope to think that your attention is being now drawn very quickly to the huts inside of these images. It's in California on the other side of the Sierra Nevada. It's also where Ansel Adams used to work and so this is also an inspiration for me when uh, making this black and white conversion. And I've used a whole variety of tools to make this black and white conversion. So um, one, I'll just click from color to black and white, which is the treatment. I might go into the um, black and white mix and start also um, darkening some colors and lightening others just by clicking and dragging. I'll add some graduated filters. There's actually four graduated filters in this image, three in the sky, one in the foreground. Uh, I'll go in and do some localized dodging and burning. You'll see at the top of the hills on the right side there, I've removed uh, very carefully because um, uh, I'm actually uh, wanting to stay behind um, that um, range of mountains there and not start spilling into the sky itself. So we've got a number of um, tools to work with this. One is called Auto Mask. Just be aware that with Auto Mask if, if, uh, you need to zoom in on that edge occasionally just to make sure you're not running down artifacts along that edge. Auto Mask is very good where we've got a clearly defined edge but if you run with Auto Mask over a very soft diffused edge you can build up these artifacts or blocks patterns in those areas and so in those instances you just need to switch the auto mask off and just go and paint a little bit more carefully just highlighting we've always got those choice for black and white profiles this is a fairly new addition so if you if you can't see those profiles it's maybe because your version of Lightroom is older than the last few current versions 
and there is a color uh, side by side with a black and white and uh, I actually don't like to present this in folio work I like to keep sections of my folio just black and white and then move and make that transition to just color rather than putting them side by side as we can see on this slide I don't think it helps to showcase them side by side at all okay so uh, once we're just looking at black and white and color is out of the equation then we can fully appreciate um, the strengths of a black and white image and then move back just to a color image only okay so here here is an inset of the color and again you can see how dramatically different uh, they they could be uh, one is a process color one is a black and white okay and again just to uh, showcase a before and after as I said I normally wouldn't showcase these um, um, side by side and, and give people the choice I will be making the choice to say whether this part of my folio go, stays color or goes into black and white let's take a look at how we can color grade our images inside of Lightroom Classic now there are many ways to approach this subject so we're going to try a, diff a few different tools and techniques here now Hollywood often doesn't use straight out of camera colors they'll often try to imbue their highlights or shadows with particular colors in order to create uh, a mood or create drama within their movies and we can do the same thing with still images as well now there is one simple technique that we can use in the presence panel which is directly uh, below the um, basic panel there and that is just to look at the vibrance and saturation sliders now one of the ways um, we can uh, do this is to limit the color palette by lowering the vibrant slider if we lower the saturation slider all the way to minus 30 uh, the image will basically be monochrome but if we lower the vibrant slider the colors that are most saturated still hang on to a little bit of their color so as we lower the vibrant slider the um, the colors of most saturation still have quite a lot of color left and we can actually pump that color back to its normal state by increasing the saturation slider so what we're doing is we're working with a limited color palette rather than using all of the colors in the image and we're letting the dominant colors um, uh, maintain their color let's take a look at an, another way we can um, influence color uh, in the basic uh, panel and the presence panel as well and the way I'm going to do this is um, this is a full color image um, the um, the portrait is taken in the shadows but there's a the sunlight uh, striking some vibrant green grass nearby is putting some of those green tones they're only subtle green tones in the hair but what I want to do is again I want to limit the color palette so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lower the vibrant slider to minus 80 and then raise the temperature slider this gives uh, a limited color semi sepia effect so negative vibrance and then a higher uh, um, temperature in order to uh, create create that um, uh, semi sepia look we can then go in and push some um, selected colors back into the image here I'm using uh, the masking brush here just to paint over the iris of each eye here and then I'm going to um, uh, raise the clarity saturation and lower the temperature slider to put a little bit of blue into the iris of those eyes so if we take a look at the finished image we've got mainly sepia but we're putting a little bit of a cool color back into the, the eyes of this uh, portrait image and I think this is very effective working with limited color rather than full color and here's another example this time uh, slightly greener eyes here on this approach I've also put a little bit of um, uh, red or uh, with uh, increased saturation back in the lips as well otherwise it would uh, look uh, very much like a sepia toned image here is a full color image again um, and what we're going to do now is we're going to um use the color grading panel uh, to push a, um, a specified color into the shadow tones and then a complementary color into the highlight tones so I'm pushing cooler blue cyan colors into those shadows and then warm highlight colors into the highlights so if we come over to that color grading panel uh, you can see you can click on the darker circle to access the shadows and the lighter 
circle to exit the highlights. You then just choose a hue. You can uh, pick it from the slider or there is a little color picker you can click on, uh, just a little box with the hue and then you can choose it from a color palette. Okay, and then you choose your level of saturation. I tend to leave the luminance slider set at zero unless I really want to lighten uh, those specific colors or darken them. Okay, here's a, another example where I'm again I'm pushing the cooler tones into the um, shadows and warmer tones into the highlights. One of the most uh, um, popular color grading techniques in Hollywood is a color palette called orange and teal. You allow a warmth into the um, lighter skin tones and then put a complementary cool color into those shadows and this gives it that cinematic quality uh, to our still images when we're color grading them. Uh, we can also color grade uh, black and white images. So we might have converted an image to monochrome or black and white. And then by uh, going into the color grading panel, we can choose just a single color, as I've done here, uh, to create that uh, sepia look. Or I can cho again choose complementary colors for highlights and shadows. Now one of the um, uh, sliders right at the bottom of the color grading panel is the balance slider. This decides um, uh, it sort of like uh, acts as a cutting off point for what is a shadow and what is a highlight. So you can lean things more towards the highlight color or more towards the shadow color just by moving that uh, balance slider from left to right. Here's another good example of color grading used to good effect here. Okay, so most of the um, uh, straight out of camera colors are leaning towards the warm colors. But of course, when we um, start pushing a cool color into the shadows, we cer cer certainly start separating out uh, the really warm colors in the image and then uh, giving complementary color feel to the cooler stonework of this cathedral in the UK. So I think this is, again, uh, a good use of color grading. You will find uh, very saturated colors tend to be immune uh, from a color that you're trying to, uh, or a complementary color you're trying to grade uh, the still image with. Patrons will be able to download uh, presets that I've created. Now presets are a way of just uh, clicking on something to color grade and style an image without having to go into the um, pa panels and select the settings you want to um, uh, create a stylized image from. So make sure you set out the, um, uh, check out those uh, presets to download from patreon.com. Let's take a look at uh, texture and dehaze, two um, quite powerful features. And so uh, sometimes people use negative clarity uh, in older versions, but I'm not fond of that adjustment. A lot of people use positive clarity and I'm okay with that, but negative clarity is, um, is, is quite a, uh, I have to say, a disturbing look. Uh, one of the things that Lightroom doesn't have compared to Photoshop is the Gaussian blur, lens blur, surface blur filters that does create beautiful smooth tones. So texture is a way of creating more sophisticated tone, soft tones now inside of Lightroom without having to go into Photoshop. Now in this particular instance I've just applied it globally. It's holding on to the sharp detail so it's not diffusing or blurring everything. It's just um, blurring predominantly the texture. But it's also blurring the wall this, um, this woman is standing in front of as well as the skin tones. So if if you were just trying to create um, uh, an adjustment that just targeted the tones that you want to work with, I would encourage you again just picking up the adjustment brush, loading or taking away the texture and then painting with that. Now you'll notice the overlay color, I've um, switched the overlay on, uh, is a very similar color to the both the skin tones and also the background tone. If that um, um, makes it difficult to paint with any degree of accuracy, if you hold down the shift key and press the O key, you can actually change the color of the overlay. And if you hold, keep holding down the shift key and press O, a number of times you can go through a couple of colors white and black and then return back to red which is the default. Uh, 
I call this my Prince Princess Fiona workflow. Uh, again, it's uh, very useful if you're painting uh, with a red mask uh, over colors which are red uh, naturally, and that does make it difficult in those instances. And so this is a before and this is an after just being a lot more flattering and I have to say if you're using um, some very expensive uh, ultra sharp primes they can be very unkind to people um, skin um, and we often um, uh, more aware of their <laughs> flaws than we were when we were actually looking at them with our own vision and uh, another way of working with that uh, texture is uh, a positive um, adjustment instead of a negative adjustment. This is um, a before and this is an after. I really wanted to highlight uh, this uh, eye of this crocodile. So I've um, I've come up with both clarity and also texture which is really enhancing uh, the texture or pattern inside of this crocodile's eye now. I've also pulled down the surrounding tone. Again it's that dodging and burning, maybe using vignettes, graduated filters just to control the tonality so I get you to look exactly where I want you to look so I can tell my story. Another very popular one that uh, came in a few years back was something called the dehaze filter. Very um, uh, uh, popular for people wanting to remove very flat looking images, maybe been uh, photographing through an airplane window or underwater um, or just a very flat and it's just a way of unpacking that image. It leans on lots of tools inside of Photoshop and you can come back a very long way to restore a very dramatic image. So let's uh, take a look at um, detail now. These are often just finishing up in an image. This is often what I do to an image uh, as the last few adjustments. I'll come in and I'll just check the sharpening. Now um, typically you may want to add sharpening to your um, your default that we talked about earlier. You might, If you always add a little bit of sharpening, why don't you just add that extra sharpening to your default. But one of the other things that I would also uh, encourage you to do is when you're deciding how much sharpening you like, just uh, zoom into 1-1 one, one or use that little preview window there. If you just click on the little triangle to expand that uh, dialog, you will see the preview. If that um, dialog box is collapsed, if you click on the information or exclamation mark there, you will be zoomed in. You can't get a true idea of how much sharpening is being applied just at the fit in view view eye where you can see the whole image. So I would encourage you to do that before doing any sharpening. Next thing I would do when you're sharpening is also work with that masking slider. Now if you hold down the Alt or Option key, it's the Alt key on a PC, the Option key on a, on a Mac, as if you hold that down whilst dragging the masking slider, everything that turns black in this threshold view is going to be protected from the sharpening process. And one of the reasons you do want to protect those tones is because you don't want to exaggerate detail often in the out of focus bokeh areas. You don't want to enhance noise in those areas. You also want to protect skin from over sharpening. And so this is a very good way of controlling exactly where your image is sharpened. And mostly we just want to sharpen the edges of our subject. Another thing that um, while we're looking at detail is um, uh, when we are doing our landscapes at maybe F11, this one's actually captured at F13, um, we've got um, uh, a few uh, sensor uh, spots that we can actually see. This is just little bits of dust sitting on the sensor. Now I typically try and clean the sensor each time I've been changing lenses at the end of the day, just blow it out with a rocket blower. Um, but in this instance I've got a couple of uh, sensor spots, maybe uh, three or more uh, that I can see. I'll just point to them here. There's one in the sky and there's one over on this extreme edge and there's just a very subtle one down in the light tones uh, by this building here. So if I want to make sure that um, uh, these uh, are not obvious uh, in my folio, I'll just go and make sure that I've retouched them out in post-processing. So I'm, I'm come to the spot removal tool and if we go into the toolbar one of the things that can help you find all of the spots more easily is just clicking the visualize spots checkbox. Move that slider backwards and forwards until you get the best view of the sensor spots and now quite quickly you're going to see 
uh, the spots are very clearly and even that subtle one now is not so subtle anymore because I'm seeing all three spots in fact there's uh, another fourth one quite subtle now but just another one that I might go in and remove as well and obviously if that gets more than three or four spots each time I'm editing my landscape images I am just going to um, clean that sensor Okay, another thing that we can do, and it's not just for removing dust spots, but it's actually um, trying to remove distracting elements within the image. Now, for when this gets really challenging, I will take an image into Photoshop, but if it's fairly straightforward, I will just do this with the spot removal tool as well. So I will just go straight in, and instead of just uh, clicking on the spot, I will click and drag along the line. So this um, little line that was coming off the back of the bird it's a little bit of a uh, tag that this uh, bird of prey because this was at a, a raptor center it's not a wild um, uh, bird and so here I can just remove it from view uh, in the spot removal so let's uh, look at uh, another powerful feature in Lightroom I'm not going to have time to go in every feature but you're certainly looking at uh, certainly what I find are the most powerful features that are common in my image editing and this one is in the uh, transform panel uh, in very earlier versions of Lightroom it used to be stacked in with the lens correction but this is not typically um, a, a distortion created by the lens being poorly made such as barrel distortion or pin cushion distortion this is um, created all these converging verticals are created by tilting a camera with an ultra wide angle lens either down or up and what happens is the verticals of this uh, bridge here Sydney Harbour Bridge are uh, being uh, unnaturally lent in now we don't remember the converging verticals leaning quite so severely because we don't have ultra wide angle lenses with our human vision so these are exaggerated by the camera and lenses that we're using so I have no problem with taking these out whatsoever and the way we can do that is go into the transform now more than 50% of the time just clicking on the word auto it's the upright feature is it will often um, find out what is the problem and just correct it I would come down and choose uh, the checkbox constrain crop it will get rid of any unnatural canvas that it's had to impose on the image so you might see the image magnifies slightly uh, in order to clean up the image often um, the auto can't do it automatically and we have to go into manual or guided here I'm working with the guided transform and the guided transform basically just means that I'm going to use uh, this tool here to fully correct this image now the way I'm doing this is I'm basically just clicking and dragging down each vertical two and then across this horizontal three and as we add in a second and third line the image starts to be corrected and I've actually added a fourth one at the bottom of the image I will then come into the crop overlay and then I might fine-tune the crop in some instances I might just pull the image a little bit smaller so I've got a little bit more flexibility about how I compose that image uh, before I select OK I personally believe everything that we do in Lightroom can be quite quickly mastered as soon as we learn uh, what the tools do and uh, and how to use those tools appropriately um, there are some things that um, are a little bit more challenging and so I'll just cover those very briefly now I have um, lots and lots of Photoshop movies as well as Lightroom movies for these slightly more complex uh, things I'm about to show you now uh, first thing off is before we start doing any um, manipulations inside of Photoshop one of the things that um, um, one of the things that we can do in, in inside of programs is start um, uh, putting images together it's it's the beginnings of photo montage or compositing where we realize that uh, one image can't tell our entire story so we start putting images together now you can sort of do this a little bit in the print module but it's a little bit clunky and so it's really uh, where you might want to leave Lightroom and come into a program like 
like Photoshop, where we can extend extend the canvas area out and start um, start tiling images together in order so to create one image, which is a composite of images put side by side. Uh, when we put two images together, they're often referred to as diptychs, and with three images, triptychs, and uh, and this is a way of extending the narrative with more than one image. In this example, for instance, I photographed this four-wheel drive on the beach. I've approached the four-wheel drive, and there's this great character um, talking, uh, having a conversation on his phone. And uh, instead of talking to the driver, I'm to I'm chatting with the, his dog. And so this extends the narrative because without that second image, you c you don't know my relationship with this four-wheel drive that I was passing while I was walking down the br uh, the beach. Likewise, if we get um, a landscape view of a forest, we can't fully appreciate how impenetrable um, that forest may be unless we take a close-up. And so sometimes putting a close-up next to a zoomed out shot together in the same canvas area is a great way of extending that communication or narrative. Um, we'll go back to that crocodile eye image that we saw earlier. Okay, so um, taking um, one image of the eye and maybe you want to see uh, what else do bits of the crocodile look at. So without showing the entire crocodile, which could have been an option, uh, I'm just showing you what his, um, his fabulous tail looks like um, just underneath his head there. Um, one of the things that we can do uh, when we don't have to leave Lightroom is we can now stitch multiple images. So it's a reason that if your wide angle lens isn't wide enough, we can do panoramic stitching. And we can also do high dynamic range stitching as well um, without leaving Lightroom. So Lightroom is certainly getting more powerful as it gets more mature. Let me quickly take you through this panoramic workflow in Lightroom Classic, where I'm going to merge three vertical images to create a wide panorama. Now, uh, you'll see that I've um, taken these images in vertical orientation. That will give me maximum foreground and uh, additional information in the sky, rather than doing a panoramic merge using horizontal format images. Now, merging these three images uh, using the 20mm f1.8g should give me an angle of view of somewhere between 12 and 14 millimeters if I'm using a 50% overlap. 50% overlap is easy because uh, whatever is in the center of one image uh, bigger, or goes to the edge of the next image that you're going to create. Now if you've got a lot of foreground information like I have in these three images, you really want to offset the camera on the tripod using a nodal slider. Now if you're going to put the camera in vertical orientation, it also helps helps to have an L bracket or L plate attached to the camera. If you don't have that foreground information, you can actually do this handheld. The camera doesn't need to be on a tripod if you don't have any immediate foreground information. So let's uh, go back into the grid view. I'll click on the first image in the sequence and then holding down the shift key, I'll click on the last image in the sequence. And then I'll right click and choose uh, Photo Merge. Uh, panorama. You'll also see there's a HDR option where you can merge bracketed image images. Now if you want the maximum quality I would probably recommend shooting five images one stop apart. Uh, I will often start my HDR images with a negative exposure because I don't want to uh, um, put too many overexposed files into that sequence. Okay so let's choose panorama in this instance. Uh, the dialog uh, box will open and I'll have a, a number of different options up there on the top right hand side. I'm going to click off the auto crop and the auto settings so you can see uh, what is happening with the stitching. Now we've got three options, spherical, cylindrical and perspective. You'll get the maximum um, sort of uh, uh, perspective by using the perspective option, but you will get a lot of information dragging in the corners, and that uh, might lower the quality of the information in those corners if you use this option. Um, so uh, cylindrical, 
Um, it doesn't give you that wider image in this instance, so I'm going to go for the first option, spherical, uh, for that more panoramic view there. Now we can crop the image, or we can go for this boundary warp. Now um, this may not work if you've got architectural detail in the corners, but if you're working just with a natural landscape, we can actually stretch the image out uh, on the edges to um, so we don't actually have to crop at all. So this is the uh, setting I'm going to use in this instance. I'll click on the auto uh, settings here and then um, click on the merge. Now as that merges obviously this might take a little bit uh, longer if you're working with 50 or 60 megapixel images. Um, I'm working with 24 megapixel images in this instance so even then we're going to create a 50 megapixel uh, a raw file from this uh, stitch. Let's just uh, double click there. You'll see in the info section this is uh, a DNG this is still a raw file format so this will still take a lot of post-production editing. So if I'm not um, completely uh, finished with this image now I can take that into the develop module. This is um, one that I'm going to show you which is definitely a light sorry a Photoshop only technique. Now in this image that I've converted to black and white again I've, I think I've got what I, uh, what I think is the perfect sky to this scene. What you can't see in this particular image though was the huge crashing waves that was crashing into and over the hero rock. Now I did wait for another five minutes and there was a gale force winding, a wind blowing towards me but I waited, I, I stuck it out, I waited for to capture one of these huge waves crashing into the rock but unfortunately when this big huge wave crashed into the rock the sky, the dramatic sky, was no longer as dramatic as it was in that previous image. So I've taken the image and really what I want to communicate is the crashing waves and the dramatic sky. I really want to compress um, that 10 minutes that I spent photographing this rock into one image. So I've taken two images into Photoshop and I've put them as layers one above another and I've tried as best I can to align um, the um, the wave image with the um, the sky image there. And now all I need to do is mask that area of sky and rock away so the two images become one. And this is definitely um, something that Photoshop uh, is a great tool for for creating a composite image. Now some people don't want to composite and I understand and photojournalists obviously can't composite but uh, when you're trying to tell a story and you, you can tell it with more than one image in the same canvas area and this is something that you want to do then Photoshop is, is a program that is going to give you access to those tools. Here's another example that's typically um, a technique often used in real estate photography where you get the hero shot of the last light of day over the building but you also want the building coming to life with the, um, the twilight um, um, with the electric lights inside the building coming on. Now um, I had to wait until there was actually no ambient light left around in the sky at all before capturing this next shot. This next shot was actually photographed with a completely black sky. All I've done is I've put that top layer, I've aligned it to the bottom layer which was quite easy because both images were captured on a tripod and then I've just put that top layer to the light and blend mode and this just acts, um, adds the pixels that are lighter on this layer to the pixels that are darker underneath. So this is a pre-dawn shoot and I'm perfectly happy with this shoot. I use, it, I use this shot as one of my folio images of Melbourne in winter uh, at uh, or just before dawn. But if a client was to say oh, we actually wanted the sun rising and uh, you're trying to please somebody else then it is possible to add the rising sun and um, you can basically just uh, pull down a file of maybe a uh, sun with some flare, add it as a layer and maybe add it to the screen or light and blend mode, do a little bit of masking also got to add a little bit uh, the, the rising sun in the reflection as well and then your work is done.
Um, this image uh, was captured in a studio and obviously it's very difficult to create lots of um, a snow effects in a studio without doing a lot of work then to clean up your own studio. So this uh, snow scene was actually added in post-production. Again, just using a stock image of a snow flurry and then just using a few blend modes to um, to create that. And the also the flare coming in the top right hand corner is also a post-production flare technique there. Uh, I also um, uh, was um, sent over to Japan with uh, Ben Q to do a composite uh, portrait shoot. This is the same uh, woman in this kimono. She's handing the umbrella that she's holding on the left to herself on the right. And this was just what's called a fixed position composite. Is You just put the camera on a tripod, uh, move the model, um, and take a second image and then just add the two images together and it's um, it only takes 10 seconds to be honest uh, to actually composite these as so long as you get the workflow right in capture to give you some uh, more examples of why we might need to leave Lightroom and go into a program like Photoshop is this image was captured of this long border coming around this bend that uh, really quite um, fast he was motoring is traveling as fast as uh, some most cycles would navigate this corner but in many respects it looks like he's stationary because the very fast shutter speed has frozen him and so it almost looks like he might just fall off uh, the back of a stationary longboard and so in post-production I've just selected the area around the long border and then applied something called a path blur I've shaped the blur in this um, arc to emulate um, his um, um, motion through this corner. Another tool, um, tool or a workflow that I might do in Photoshop rather than Lightroom is um, something quite extensive retouching where it might be beyond the capabilities of the spot removal tool or it might just take too long. The spot removal tool does, um, it's labor intensive inside of Lightroom where moving pixels uh, inside of Photoshop is actually very, very fast. And so I'll typically just um, uh, edit in, open this up in Photoshop and um, uh, we'll do the work in Photoshop, hit save and this edited version will appear alongside the original version, the original raw file inside of Photoshop. The important aspect of that workflow is just choose the edit in from Lightroom, save, don't choose where to save to and by default Lightroom will re-import that edited version. So what I'm doing here is I'm working non-destructively because I'm doing this on a separate layer is I'm using something called the patch tool. Um, Photoshop has this um, uh, algorithm called content aware and so it can content aware fill things that you've moved out of the way because they're distractions inside of the images and you can see even just with a very simple click drag around your subject move to one side it replaces it to sky 90% of the time it does a seamless transition uh, something that Lightroom would struggle with if you get a, an image like this um, inside of Lightroom and you've got that sort of one gap in between those two uprights of this Tory gate in Japan, that's quite a lot of work with the patch tool and you will get very frustrated. Whereas if you work in the patch tool inside of Photoshop, it can be fixed uh, so that most people won't even notice it in just a few seconds. And I only spent a few seconds there. I could probably do a little bit of further work to um, make that um, more unnoticeable than it is already. Um, this uh, was a little bit more work, I have to say, is um, capturing this uh, bird coming in to nest. We've got a, a tree in the background and I do want to extend the canvas. That's right the edge of the frame there. And I wanted to extend a little bit more sky onto the right side to create this square composition. So all of that I've managed to do inside of Photoshop. Um, something again, Lightroom can't go anywhere near these type of workflows. The great thing for Lightroom users, because it's the Creative Cloud, if you've got Lightroom Creative Cloud, it means you already have Photoshop. You just need to download it. It's part of the photographer's plan or the full plan. And so you can get to grips with working this companion piece of software to Lightroom. Um, this is an example where the image was actually captured in 3.2. If a client says we need it in the 16.9 aspect ratio, if I crop to 16.9, I would crop into the top of his 
hat or I would crop in and lose the majority of his hand. So what I want to do is I don't want to crop into the figure at all. I just want to extend the background out into those empty areas. So I've extended the canvas out into 16.9 and then using something called Content Aware Scale I've just stretched the image and Photoshop knows where my primary subject is because I've made a, a mask for that subject and I've just stretched out the street scene, the blurry street scene in the background to create my 16-9 aspect ratio crop. Okay, one of the most um, advanced um, uh, Photoshop um, techniques for skin retouching is uh, something called frequency separation. Yes, you saw earlier we were just um, softening up the skin a little bit uh, in post-production um, using the texture slider, but um, we can actually get much more sophisticated results using a technique called frequency separation. And this can only be done inside of Photoshop because it uses one of the tools called Gaussian Blur as part of the algorithm. Uh, another one of the things that is only possible in, um, in um, Photoshop is using another one of the very sophisticated blur tools called Lens Blur. And this is creating that tilt shift toy town effect that uh, was very popular a few years ago where we create a simulated lens blur at the top and the bottom of the image and just uh, hold focus. It's an effect we can create with tilt shift lenses but it's also possible to create in post-production but not in Lightroom, only in Photoshop. Another um, thing that we might use, again it's another one of the sophisticated blur tools, is um, the one of this time it's the surface blur. I actually picked up the reflections of a window because I was shooting through a window for this sh shot and it's very difficult to remove those uh, artifacts inside of Lightroom without seeing telltale tide marks in that sky. So again I just selected the sky inside of Photoshop and then applied um, uh, quite a strong surface blur to get rid of that um, um, distractions inside of Photoshop and there is the completed image. One of the uh, great things about Photoshop as well is even if you're a novice there there are people who sell and share actions. I share Photoshop actions on my own website and so with just a few clicks you could for instance uh, change this image um, uh, into this image, uh, apply just um, a texture to that image and create that. So um, hopefully you've enjoyed that and uh, you've uh, learnt one or two things. I know I've probably been um, rattling on now for a couple of hours so you may have had to a pause, gone off and had lunch and then come back. But if you found that useful make sure you do head over to my website www.markgaylor.com